So it gives me great pleasure to introduce our first speaker for the day. Uh, so joining us all the way from Australia, we've got Elizabeth Uriev, who completed her undergraduate degrees in Ukraine and then moved to Melbourne to do a PhD in computational chemistry, then headed to Oklahoma for a postdoc. She then returned to Australia and has been teaching chemistry at Monash University. Um, her research was initially focused on structure-based drug design, but in 2013 she refocused to chemistry education research. And through this, her main interests are problem solving and flexible assessments, also known as um, open note exams, which um, has been a feature for a lot of us this year. Elizabeth is currently an associate professor in the Faculty of Pharmacy and Pharmaceutical Sciences and has published her research widely. So I'm going to pass over control to Elizabeth. You'll see the Jamboard and the slide links there. Elizabeth, are you able to request control? Uh, yes, but um, it's my file next after this one. I've added them into this slide deck so it should work. OK. And can you remind me what I need to do? Uh, control Shift X. Yeah, Control Shift X turns off presenter view if you've got that. Uh, it just tells me stop presenting. Should I do that? Should I click on stop presenting? Um, no, we, we can see just the slides. We're not seeing presenter view. OK. So it's uh, just your let view. Let me check it back in. OK, that's fine. If you just see the slides, but I can't, I can't um, change this. Oh, yes, I can. OK, uh, let me just see, check again. Yeah, I can do that. Excellent. Um, okay. Thank you very much, um, Catherine. Thanks for the um, introduction and very importantly for the for the invitation. I'm really very excited and, and honoured to be presenting here at MISA. So I will be talking about mixed methods research into metacognition in problem solving. I'm planning to have this as an interactive session, but I'm not going to be using um, breakout rooms. Instead, there will be um, a few times when I just throw a question to, to, to the whole audience and ask to um, respond either in the chat or in the Jamboard. And um, Catherine, um, Thank you very much. Created separate three separate boards for the questions that I will be asking. So you've got a bit of a preview there. Uh, with that, let me start. So because um, this second day of my site is is flagged for research, ed chemistry education research for after COVID, I will start before COVID and I will talk about what we've done in our research into problem solving before, during, so basically last year, and then what I'm thinking um, should be, should be um, or could be what we're doing in the future. Because when clearly from the pre-conference pre, uh, conversation, we're still mostly in it at the moment. So here is my first question. I'm going to start straight away with asking you, why do you think chemical problem solving is challenging? Uh, clearly, I'm making an assumption here that you agree with me that it is challenging. Um, uh, it's definitely challenging for many, um, most of our students at different stages. So please um, share your, your ideas about this. I will run this as a sort of one minute paper uh, and then um, I will summarize or will try to summarize or comment on on some responses. Uh, but I will uh, what I'm planning to do is after the conference, add a few couple slides uh, where I um, pick on themes from um, from audience responses. So I noted that there are responses started coming up in the Jamboard. Someone mentioned the vocabulary. This is great. Yeah, it has to be on, it's on the third page in the Jamboard. Thanks, Madeline.
it's interesting to see in the gym what while people are responding, you can see that they're there before you, before you can see what they're actually saying. Excellent. There are lots of responses on the Jamboard and please continue adding your sticky notes or your text boxes. And um, in the anticipation of, um, of these responses, I prepared a list and um, quite a few of my suggestions are already on the Jamboard. <coughs> so um, I had a look at the literature and some of it we have published in the past and separated all the sort of causes for um, difficulty in problem solving into three into three aspects. First of all, it's the field itself. So chemistry is a complex field with complex concepts, language all of its own and the representational levels. And some of these things been mentioned on the gem board. And then there is what students do. And so when they solve problems, when a lot of time they use unproductive approaches such as memorize algorithms or failure to restructure the problem again thing that's been mentioned uh, by some of you and then there is what we do and if if our teaching approaches are, are flawed then students problem solving will be flawed if we focus on algorithms so will students if we assess just by looking at the at the correct number at the end for quantitative problems so students will value that and if we don't teach them to think meta to be metacognitive then they will not be um, engaging with that and so the result of the result of all this issue that's where the need for scaffolding comes up specifically for metacognitive scaffolding before I focus on metacognitive scaffolding, I would like to flag the uh, work that we've done uh, recently last year with uh, Nicole Grolich and Axel Langner on the continuum view at scaffolding. So at one, at one uh, extreme, you have metacognitive scaffolding, which is content independent and on the other extreme there is instructional scaffolding specific prompts that are integrated into tasks and it doesn't have to be one or the other it could be a blending of the scaffold so you could choose a scaffold that has certain element of uh, one or the other depending what it is that that you're trying to achieve with your students so check out this um, chapter that's been published uh, recently but I will now proceed um, to, um, to talk about scaffolding. So um, again, I looked at the literature and divided roughly the, the types of research questions people ask about scaffolding into, into four types. So first of all, people look at what the scaffold is, what are the features of the scaffold? Uh, then uh, there are questions about how to deploy the scaffold and here are a couple examples of our own because these are these examples of studies is from um, not not only from chemistry education research but there are a couple of hours here when Laurie and again Nicole Grolich looking at the deployment of the scaffold then there is literature on what are the outcomes of the scaffold and particularly out of interest to us and it's um, aligns with our recent uh, recent work is how to balance, how to align the scaffold with specific uh, learner characteristics. And so here's my second question for you. How do you come up with your research questions? Not necessarily about problem solving or scaffolding or, or metacognition, just generally your in your um, research project. So there is a Jamboard, uh, I think it's page number uh, four, um, so um, tell us, share with us, where do your research questions come from? Mm -hmm. 
Stacey, I can see your um, I can see your post in the um, in the chat. Please, please. Um, yep, yeah, you can't you can't access Jamboard, so please please post in the chat. Oh, someone just put something really, oh, thank you, <laughs> really big. Interestingly, someone is trying to do a, a triangle sticky notes, I think. Thank you very much. Keep keep contributing, um, and I will move on. And again, um, I kind of preempted slightly the responses, but I'm <laughs> glad that I'm glad that some of them I can already see them on the Jamboard. So um, generally, in social science, the four P of social science are people, problems, programs, and phenomena. So our research questions always deal with one or more of those. But in, okay, someone took control um, of my slides. Can you please give them back to me? I'm just um, resharing them, don't worry. Uh -huh, that's okay. Um, I will keep talking in the meantime. Um, no, you can take control again, Elizabeth. Okay, thank you. OK, um, thanks, Catherine. So, um, but in, in the education, in the education field, it's usually a problem that encounters in the teaching context or if you're a PhD student or, or a student or a researcher working with someone, it's usually an issue identified by the supervisor. So these are the two main areas, but of course there are other ones such as knowledge gap or an interesting question. In my case, the it was definitely problem encountered in my teaching context. So when I when I started doing education research, I have been already teaching for quite a few years, and it was pro students problem uh, struggling with problem solving. More specifically, it's when students were getting stuck or they could didn't know how to start, and that they just they just froze and couldn't proceed. Um, so we we published about that, and I'll show a reference in a in, in a few seconds. But so that paper was published in early 2017, and then there was a Rocky Congress um, in July that year, which um, George Bordner came to, and. Um, I believe it was his um, last trip to Australia. Uh, so I was really um, um, fortunate to, um, that wasn't my first um, time, but I got to spend quite a bit of time with him on that trip. And he actually quoted that paper um, and quoted the, the the saying about dead ends and false start in his presentation. So it was like a career highlight for me and, and also at confirmation. So I knew I was on the right track with that with that particular research question. So we addressed that um, research question and done a lot of research on it by developing metacognitive scaffold. But then the second the second wave was when uh, when we gave it to students and we found that students engage or sometimes do not engage with it or engage differently. So this is our more recent research, which I will quickly show at the end. So this is the scaffold that we developed called Goldilocks Help. It has a, um, it takes students through five main stages of solving uh, problems, understand, analyze, plan, implement, and evaluate. It's got feedback loops, it's got metacognitive prompts, um, and this version is for quantitative problems, so gen chem, phys chem, analytical chemistry problems. We also have an organic version. And the research questions we're asking about it are how do we teach um, um, 
problem solving, key scaffolding, and what do students actually do, how they engage with scaffolding. We're also interested, um, can I ask a question, Catherine, can, can people see my cursor, my pointer? Um, can I can't. Yeah. OK, so I guess no one no one can in this mode. So um, that's OK. I think it is um, reasonably self-explanatory, but I'm pointing just for myself. So how how do we teach with scaffolding? How do students engage with scaffolding? And then we're interested in what actually happens when students are solving problems, sort of what happens in the invisible uh, space of their brain and what are the modulating effects of their prior knowledge process skills, as well as attitudes and effect. Um, the theory um, underpinning our work, three main theories are scaffolding, metacognition and self-regulated learning. I'm not going to go into details and there are references there, so please reach out to me if you want uh, specific bibliographic details. But I do want to, on the right hand side of the slide, I've got a, a uh, main structure of metacognitive awareness, which corresponds to knowledge of cognition, declarative, procedural and conditional, which is um, what you can do, how you do that and at, under what circumstances. And on the right hand side, regulation of, con of cognition, such aspects as planning, monitoring, and evaluations, and I will be referring to this later. So if, if I go back to complexity of problem solving and its implications for research, basically when people solve, and students, um, I hope people too, when they solve problems, there are visible or measurable aspects, um, things that we can um, largely study with quantitative methods. Um, but on the other hand, there is things that are invisible. So when, when they solve problems, what are they actually thinking? And are they actually monitoring their thought processes? And therefore, um, we need a mixed methods research. And so my next question to you is, what is your experience with mixed methods research? So there are quite a few questions there, so pick one. There is a Jamboard page for that, which is the next one, and please, share your experience. Or your experience could be that you haven't done it and just want to learn about it. OK, it started. I thought it froze a little bit. Um, Jeff is saying that the Jamboard is blocking because there are too many people. Um, in that case, please post in the in the chat. Um, and there are there are some excellent um, responses, and some people are just ticking um, yes to what someone else posted, which is great too. So. Um, with with mixed method design, there are multiple and very complex um, complex designs for mixed methods research, but largely, basically, it is about combining quantitative and qualitative data. And on the Jamboard, there was someone who said never done it, and someone said very experienced with it. So it's great we have a a, a range uh, range of participants here. So I picked th um, three main designs, and these are the ones that we actually um, used in our work. Uh, convergent is where qualitative and quantitative data are used 
collected simultaneously and then merged for interpretation. And then there are sequential designs where the qualitative first or quantitative first and for different purposes. It could be either exploratory or explanatory um, purpose of this study. So, so, okay, so mixed method is about combining qualitative and quantitative data. We're also making a distinction what type of data it is. It's either self-reported, so what, that's when students are qualitatively in the interviews or quantitatively in the survey, and not only students, just participants in general, that's when they um, tell us what they think about problem solving or their experience, or it could be a observed or collected data of students actually doing problem solving. It's think aloud interviews or written work. So taking what's what's happening in their brain and then putting it into words or, or work artifacts. And I'm putting both qualitative and quantitative there because we can al analyze this data both quantitatively and qualitatively. So the first the first uh, project that I will show you was about convergent design, and that's the earliest work um, my group has done on uh, problem solving. So this was the data collected from the cohorts of 2015-2016, where we uh, deployed the Goldilocks uh, problem solving workflow. And then uh, at the start of the semester, sorry, um, we, we administered the uh, questionnaire at the start of the semester, then deployed the workflow, did a lot of work with students during the semester in problem solving space, and then collected the data again using the same instrument. And uh, what we found is that, well, it's over the course of one semester, so there was a modest increase in student self-awareness of strategies, uh, problem solving strategies. They self-reported improvement on um, aspects such as planning and information management, and they self-reported that the uh, monitoring and evaluation is challenging. We also collected qualitative data from the same cohort of students, and we published the detailed uh, thematic analysis of it here. I'm just showing a couple of main themes and, uh, and, and, and codes from those themes. So students talked about so that's in parallel with doing the survey. They also talked about their changes in their problem solving strategies. But what we found from that, um, from, from, from this data is that students often had a simplistic understanding of what problem solving is. And they often talked about that good problem solving is the one that they can do quickly, right? So it's um, efficiency um, rather than effectiveness. Um, the challenges that they reported are the ones not knowing where to start and also how to verbalize uh, their thought, thought process um, to show their reasoning. So from that initial project, these results demonstrated that provided with metacognitive scaffolding, students can shift in their belief and, and become aware of strategies are success, um, need, need to be used to be successful in problem solving. Um, they they can engage relatively easy with planning and information management, but they struggle with monitoring and um, linking the concepts to the process. So it's one semester only. Skill development does take time. We also found that some students just simply did not engage with the scaffold. So our take home message from that in terms of um, teaching implication was it needs to be actively integrated into instruction. It's not enough just to give it to students. Importantly, we also, we were aware and the reviewers of our paper were very much aware of it and asking questions about it. That was just self-reported data. So it didn't give us um, a full picture and left many, many questions unanswered. So after that, we moved into the exploratory uh, sort of design um, of, of our research into, into problem solving. Uh, specifically, over a period of years, we have been collecting the um, written 
student work. So up till that point, of course, I have seen plenty of written work, mostly on the exam or in class when I could see students writing in their notes or, or, or on whiteboards. From, from that point on, what we actually introduced activities where students had to submit their written work so we we could get um, we could analyze it in more detail and we could see immediately that there is clear distinction between the students who uh, demonstrate their problem solving process and those that don't and often correlates whether they're successful or not successful to actually getting to the correct answer. So here's just example from a couple of from two students um, solving a um, so that's Klaus's Clapeyron equation that just had to predict a boiling temperature at a specific pressure and you could see that the student on the left who got the correct answer they demonstrated their conceptual understanding with student on the right so first of all there is no no a leading into the question to demonstrate understanding but what's more the student actually demonstrated the lack of understanding so they wrote out an equation equation has a constant and they realize they don't know what the value of the constant is so they just decided well then it's zero um, the process itself you can see the um, dimensional analysis either done and done well we often see that students don't do it at all or do it incorrectly and very important is the evaluation of the final answer so here correct answer being commented on and on the right hand side patently wrong answer and student just moves on without without commenting on it so we took this qualitative data and based on that we designed a rubric of how to score this type of data we started with the ellipse um, validated rubric for problem solving and we adopted it to be aligned with the so we used the description descriptions from the ellipse rubric but we aligned it to the Goldilocks uh, problem solving workflow and then we use this rubric to um, to score student um, um, student written written work and some of it has been published in the big yellow book. So here is the example of uh, the output from that scoring in this particular case that actually that thermodynamics problem uh, we divided students based on whether they got the correct answer or not into successful and unsuccessful and then looked at how many of those students uh, demonstrated the elements of understand, analyze, plan, implement and evaluate. And you can see on the left hand side of this figure that students that were able to solve the problem correctly also demonstrated um, large percentage of those students demonstrated um, full sort of uh, according to the rubric uh, analysis, planning and implementation where those on the right hand side um, did not. Uh, a big challenge is evaluation to both um, students who do solve problem correctly and those that don't. And the ones who solve it correctly, you could probably interpret it that they, they may have evaluated, but they didn't write it down, where those who solved it correctly clearly, um, if they don't comment on the correct answer, it's a sign that they have not evaluated it at all. And then we moved on to the explanatory um, sequential design. And I will, um, in the spirit of full disclosure, uh, the three parts were not designed to go from convergent exploratory to explanatory. It just happened that way. So in the explanatory, we started we start with qualitative data and then we sorry with quantitative data and then we use qualitative to explain some of the findings and that was the work that we've done last year so this was the one done during the pandemic and that's where um, we designed a an assignment cycle where for each topic students do and in this case there were four topics per semester uh, there is some conceptual metacognitive instruction then followed by um, their lectures, workshops, and last year it was all online. And then students are given a problem uh, for which they have to solve this problem, pose the answer, and upload the solution. Then the expert solution is released, and then students have to, um, to uh, uh, compare their solution 
to the expert solution and post a comparative reflection. So at first we collect quantitative data, um, student self-assessment and they score their work on the rubric. So now it becomes quantitative data. Uh, and we identify the challenges again, relating to what we saw previously, linking conceptual understanding to the problem solving process and then also evaluating their answer. And what we're doing currently is qualitative analysis of the um, student comparative reflections. Um, this is quite a lot of data. So there are four cycles, about 150 students. So we've got six uh, pieces of qualitative data to analyze. And Kimberly Vo, who's that's part of her PhD student, is currently doing this analysis. Uh, but I'm just going to show some preliminary theme that we are finding from um, from these from these reflections. Um, by comparing to expert solutions, students both some of them um, in, increase in confidence especially if their solution and answer is correct and solution similar to the expert, but also um, Im improved or increased self-awareness. They find flaws in their own solution and their flaws are both in terms of the process, but also in terms of conceptual understanding. Uh, and they're able to identify improvement strategies um, from, from that comparison. So, to conclude from that work that we've done on written analysis of written work and reflections, um, we found that students self-reported difficulties from both earlier quantitative and qualitative work were confirmed by the analysis of written work. So we've got these two point of view, self-reported and analysis of artifacts. Uh, we found the explanation for some of the uh, quantitative findings from student talking about the flaws and improvement strategies in their both problem solving process and conceptual understanding. Very important implication for teaching from the work on uh, contrast and compare part of this project is that uh, when students are given a regular opportunities to reflect on their work, for example, by comparing it to an expert solution, they um, it causes them to become more realistic in their self-assessment uh, to identify strengths, weaknesses and gaps and also to identify improvement strategies. And here we come to the most recent work that we have done and, and still doing. It is how do we actually, how we do and how we should teach um, problem solving given scaffolding. And here I just want very briefly to highlight the poster. So Kim will be um, presenting her poster in the in the session today, poster number 13, where exactly she will show the work on uh, where we have another point of view, and that is teaching associates who um, do most of the work of teaching with the scaffold. So mixed methods. Uh, they this can be the finding from um, qualitative and quantitative um, data and analysis could be integrated for uh, deeper interpretation because quantitative really just tells us what where qualitatives can tell us why the, these are more sophisticated than either qual or quant uh, we can integrate different perspectives which is what we've done uh, we can it could be used to explain quantitative results with with qualitative findings which is what we're doing as well and and still very much work in progress and um, just to to finish my talk what what could we be doing as a field or just us individually, the group um, investigating problem solving in the in the new world we're finding ourselves in? So and I cheated a little bit, if you will. I went and looked at the po well, I wrote my own slides and then I went and looked at the posters and I found some some interesting um, connections bit between my thoughts and what's what's in the posters and some talks. So we could be um, asking new research questions about specific aspects of problem solving, such as abstraction or mindsets. Um, we could and should be uh, looking, and this is wider than just problem solving, about students adjusting to these new ways of learning and teaching, largely 
associated with doing it remotely and online. We wrote, it, it is a bit of a wicked problem and we wrote a little bit about that in the chapter that's been accepted recently into the ACS Symposium series uh, book, but there are various things that could be done and should be done there because students struggle to stay engaged and or motivated. Um, the students with low self-regulation, a weaker prior knowledge, in the classroom, face to face, we can address those things. When it's online, it's much harder. It's harder for us to address it, but it's also harder for students to deal with it. Um, so that's research questions. We could be looking at new context and learning environments. And I want to point out that this written work, students' written work, it's not just something that we can use in research. It's something we can use in practice as a as the um, interaction point between students and students or students and instructors. Um, using new methods of data collections, online interviews or instant messaging, as we saw last time, or eye tracking. Again, uh, there was a great poster from Axel and Nicole about that uh, two weeks ago, or using new methods of data analysis. And I'm really looking forward to visiting um, poster number 14 um, later today on machine learning for scoring student work. Uh, I would like to thank um, the people on this slide. I'm not going to read all the names, but this work would not be um, the same without them. And I'm happy to answer questions. Thank you very much, uh, Elizabeth. That was absolutely fantastic. Uh, we do have a little bit of time for questions. Um, so if anybody has one, I've got half an eye on the Jamboard, half an eye on the chat, or you're more than welcome just to unmute and ask away. Michael Siri has a hand up first. Uh, Michael. Too lazy, too lazy to type. One issue in mixed methods, Elizabeth, is whether you lean one way or the other, whether you quantify a lot and qualify a little or the other way around. Uh, have you any sense in your own work as to whether you're Qualitative research influences the quantitative or the other way around? And, and what advice um, would you give people about that? Look, I think it's courses for horses, and I know it's probably an unsatisfactory answer, um, but I think it depends on the project and the research question. It's interesting, I personally come from quantitative background very much, computational chemistry. Um, but I love qualitative work because it's just, and maybe because I'm a practitioner, it really, it's, I, it's me a researcher doing analysis, but me a practitioner there saying, yes, that's why. So I, I know it's probably unsatisfactory, Michael, but I think it depends. And maybe people more experienced with mixed methods uh, can correct me on this. We, we've got um, Vicky Hillborn also has her hand up. Hello, thank you. Thank you for a, a really interesting presentation. It's, um, it's probably a bit of a big question and leads on from Michael's. I'm really interested in understanding a bit more about val uh, the validity and reliability of quantitative analysis in this with this kind of data. Could you say what methods you would use to determine the validity or reliability? Uh, sorry, were you asking about uh, quantitative or qualitative? Sorry, quantitative. Quantitative. Yeah. So with the, um, I should, you can go later and have a look quickly at the slides or the paper. We did use the, so the instrument that we initially used was already validated. So we just we just adopted it for our purpose, but we did run Cronbach alphas to just to see, and we were in the 75 to 85 um, percent range. So that was um, we were satisfied with with that. Uh, with respect to the rubric, there is, that's another quantitative instrument. Again, that was a validated rubric. So for people who do develop new quantitative instruments based on qualitative data, um, yeah, full-blown factor analysis is what should be done, but we didn't use those instruments. Um, we didn't, I mean, design the entirely novel instruments. 
Okay, thank you. Uh, and, and then, I don't know if you were here two weeks ago, there was a presentation about um, um, about the all these ex aspects for quantitative analysis, so it's probably um, good to go and have a look back on that. Yeah, unfortunately, I couldn't make that one, so I'll okay. do that. So, so I think Catherine is going to, the, it's going to be posted both the slide and the talk, and it is my understanding that they published this work in SERP recently. Okay, thank you. Okay, time for one final question. Uh, Michael O'Neill. Um, thank you so much for the talk. I, I, I guess the, the question in my head is that every year we um, we arguably research how good students are at problem solving through traditional assessment in university degrees. Um, I, I guess I wonder if, if you think your research has any um, perhaps particular implications for assessment in higher education. I don't think it's novel that we should not be assessing just a, if it is a quantitative problem, we should not be assessing the number at the end. We should be assessing the process that students um, that students undertake to get there, their reasoning, their um, the 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 reasoning at the start and the reasoning at the end, where they they justifying their answer. I know it's difficult because it is much more time consuming and much more expensive. But we we have recently been designing the um, the questions for online assessment, and so the technology there to uh, allow students to demonstrate that reasoning without necessarily uploading their written work. But we're we're doing that as well. So, um, but but it is it it is difficult because it is harder. But again, to, to quote the famous quote is, uh, if you don't assess what's important, what you assess becomes important. Great, thank you very much. Uh, those were some great questions. And if you join me in thanking Elizabeth again, um, that was... <laughs>